Hello everybody. Today I'm going to introduce you to Simon Tatum's Portable Puzzle Collection. It's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll probably just call it the Portable Puzzle Collection. Now this collection is 39 small puzzle games. They're all released under an open source license and they, there is a wide variety of puzzles included here. Now these puzzles are intended to be a brief respite from the daily grind. You won't be playing them for more than a few minutes at a time, but in my opinion, they're a great way to take a break, perhaps with a cup of strong coffee. Now I'm not gonna cover all of the 39 puzzles as that would take a month of Sundays, but I will show you a few of the games. You've probably played Minesweeper in Windows, completed a Sudoku puzzle, published in a newspaper, and if you have any age, enjoy the game of Mastermind with your siblings. Well, these are popular puzzle games included in the collection. Now, there's lots of other puzzles. A few of them were invented by Nikoli, which is a puzzle magazine available in Japan that concentrates on logic puzzles. They have devised many different puzzles. But there's original puzzle games in this collection, and there are others from elsewhere that, that have been devised by other people. So there's lots to enjoy. So let's take a look at a few of them. Well, the first game that we're gonna have a look at is called Guess in the Collection. It's in fact a clone of the classic deductive code-breaking game, Mastermind. Now Mastermind was a two-player game, or is a two-player game, where one player, the code maker, hides a four-color peg combination, and the other player, the code breaker, tries to identify all four color pegs by trying test patterns. Now, in Mastermind, it was actually a two-player game, but with Guess, the game becomes a single-player game with a computer taking the role of the code maker. Now, dark circles indicate the number of match, coloured and placed pegs. A white circle indicates a peg is the correct colour, but in the wrong position. So let's try an opening gambit of four red pegs and there are, and that's telling me because all these four are grey that there are no red pegs in the solution. Now I refer to them as pegs because that's what they were in the original mastermind that I used to play. Now we know that there are two yellow in the solution obviously because I put all four yellow discs that two of them had to be in the correct position. I don't know which two are so I'll try two green and two yellow and I now know that there are two yellow, one of which, and we know that there's one green, but the green was not correctly placed, so it can't be there. So I'll, I'll try that as my combination. And now I have guessed that all four colors correctly, although there's only one that's actually in the correct spot. So I'm gonna put the green back, and I'm gonna assume that the yellow is there. It can't be like that though, can it? Because because that green can't be there. I'll leave that there. Put the blue there and the green there. Nope, I've made it worse. I need to think a little bit, but obviously time is pressing. So I won't spend a long time trying to solve this particular puzzle. Let me just give it a few seconds thought. We'll try the green there, the yellow there, the blue there, and the other yellow there. And we're getting closer, two are correct and two are incorrect. So we'll swap the green and the yellow around. And voila, we have solved the puzzle. Now we took seven moves to solve it. It's quite interesting really, because Donald Knuth, you may have heard of him, he's the creator of the tech computer typesetting system published an academic paper back in 1976 that showed that the code breaker can always solve this puzzle 
in five moves or less. And obviously I didn't solve it in five moves or less, so I didn't do it in the most efficient way. Now the game doesn't end there. There are different types that you can play. There's a super version, so you see you get an extra color, and there's a few more guesses, and there's also a custom mode where you can choose the number of colors, the number of pegs per guess, and the number of guesses, and whether or not you allow blanks or duplicates. Now the second game in the collection that we'll take a look at is called Mines. It's a clone of Minesweeper, a single player puzzle game made extremely popular by Windows because it was included in the early versions of Windows and there weren't many games included other than the Solitaire game. Um, you've probably played the game, but if not, the objective of the game is to clear a rectangular board which contains mines without detonating any of them. Um, you get help with clues about the number of neighbouring mines in each field. It's an old puzzle game. It goes back to the 1960s and it's been written for lots of different computing environments and it has many variations and offshoots. So if we click into the square, the left mouse button, immediately it's told me that all of these squares are clear of mines. We know that there, there must be a mine there because that square is indicating that there's one mine adjacent diagonally, horizontally or vertically to that square. So I can put that, mark the flag, and there must be a, a mine there as well. There must be a mine there in that corner. It's always worth looking for the corners. There can't be any mines around here or there. There must be a mine there. And that's basically how you play mines. There are quite a few different game types that you can play with more mines or larger grid sizes. And there's also a custom mode which you can define your own size of the grid. So that's mines. Minesweeper. Now the next game we'll take a look at is called Tents. As you can see you've got a grid of squares and there are some trees placed in some of the squares. We also notice there are numbers down the sides of the grid and they indicate the number of tents that are located in either that row or the column. Now there are the same number of tents as trees. The tent, there has to be a tent next to a tree Tents cannot be next to each other. The number of tents match the columns and the rows that are indicated here. And so, for example, in this row, we know for a fact that there are no tents. Now, I find it easy to use the right map button to start with and just indicate all the positions on the map that there cannot be a tent. So there are no tents here because the row indicates that is zero and that indicates that there's no tents. Now there are tents in all these columns, but we also know that the squares which are not adjacent, horizontal or vertically cannot have a tent. So there cannot be a tent there and they, a tent cannot be diagonally to a tree. So it can't be there, there, there or there or there. And I'll just go around marking on the map where there cannot be tents. And I'll probably miss a few, but it doesn't matter because as I go along through the puzzle, I think I've covered all of the positions on the map where there cannot be tents. And I just marked them with green just to be a visual aid. Now, straight away, this is um, an easy level of the game. I can I know for a fact that there are two tents in this column and there's only two spaces left. So that's where they must be. There cannot be tents diagonally to each other so that can't be a tent there so that tent goes to that tree that tent goes to that tree there must be a tent there because it, the tent can't be diagonal to a tree and we know that there are two tents in this column so there must be a tent there so that that can't be a tent because it's got that tree has got its tent um, and so we just proceed using our logic there's, there's one tent in that column, so it must be there. That tree can't have two tents next to it. So that there, there must be a tent there. There must be a tent there. We've got three, so obviously there can't be a tent there. That tree has, there's only one position its tent could be. Same for that tree there. That tree must have a tent there. 
that tree must have a tent there and there's the last tent there and we've solved the puzzle there are different types of game modes so i was playing it on easy with an 8x8 grid as you can see and it was very easy but the, you can play it in a much harder variant with a, at the same size or 10 by 10 or even 15 by 15 I and mean, if you've done all of them you can then do have whatever size width and height that you choose and choosing from easy and tricky so that's tense it's a fun little puzzle game one of one of my favorites of the collection obviously the easy mode's too easy but but once you start increasing the map size it can be a good diversion for a few minutes now the next game we'll take a brief look at is called inertia now in this game you play a small green ball and your job is to collect all of the gems which are indicated by these squares without running into any of the mines now your ball is only stopped by a stop symbol or by a block or the outer perimeter of the map so for example if i was to click there my green ball will run into that mine and i will die so i can't collect those two gems by going in that direction i would for example have to come a different direction could come from there and go down to there so let's try that so up there that stopped but i would have stopped anyway because that was the perimeter i've collected that gem i can go down there click that and there's the stop symbol that stopped me in my tracks i can click that gem and go down there click that gem now if i go there i will if i go to the left i will die because i'll run into the mine so I, i'll go right instead go down to this stop again i can't collect these gems that way i can go down there i can go up there because that stop symbol will stop me go down there and i can go all the way up here without running into a mine go down to here back to here i will be stopped so i can go there and now i've got to get the, the remaining three gems without running into a mine down there there i can go go down to that will take me all the way down to here really want to go all the way down there but we'll go up to here back to here so we click that mine click that gem i mean to here now i need to get to here now and the quickest way i would think is to go i can't go up through so i'll go there up to here there there i've lost my way a bit here and i'm going to end up in the same place so i've i can come down here down here down here i can't go and collect there because I, I will eventually run into that mine so i'll go there there back to here and i've completed the puzzle now that was with the smallest grid available you can play in 15 12 or 20 16 grid or make your own custom so you can make the puzzle much more complicated and a bit more time consuming to complete but it's quite a nice little puzzle one of the, one of the better ones of the collection that i've never played before now the final game we'll take a look at is called solo it's an implementation of sudoku one of the most famous puzzle games ever devised and basically you have to have every three by three with the numbers one to nine there can't be duplicates of numbers in in any of the other rows or columns so for example there can't be the one there there can't be the one there or there can't be the one there and you you go through the puzzle and you work out using logic where the numbers are in each of the squares it's quite 
quite a complex puzzle because you can have different skill levels and different sizes of the grid and there's a good variety of game modes in this particular version so it will keep you occupied for quite some time right thank you very much for watching this video if you like the video please give it a like on youtube and subscribe to our channel we'd really appreciate it now take care everybody have fun